The next couple are from uh, the book The Side of Skin. As always, whenever you read old stuff, you just cringe a little, so bear with me. Sonnet for Rilke in February. Winter in Oaxaca, where weak against El Norte's brutal elements, the ground broken open only for the dead. I cower in the Zopalo, at a loss for words outrun by that elusive verse, weeping at the scent of gardenias, their strength these hours outweighing my own. Thoughts turn to Rilke, steadying himself like stripped birch against February's blows, hearkening to Orpheus in that one single breathless act of obedience. Oh, to possess Rilke's faith, his courage to take root, awake, await the miraculous blooms, the bees stirred and rising to their tasks. The fire. The night Tony decided to end it all, bathing his head and limbs in gasoline and igniting himself into effigy in the third floor dressing room of the theater, roaring and tumbling down the stairs like the damned on their way to hell. You were working late in the scene shop. Goggles on, all safety procedures met, guiding plywood through table saw's teeth. The night Tony seared the shop's door frame with the stench of flesh in flames and the screams pouring from the O once his mouth now melting away. You stayed calm, moved quickly, took all the necessary precautions. You knew what to do to save his life and your own and you did it, and then you drove home, pulled two six-packs from the fridge, hauled them to the back porch, tilted your face toward the heavens, and drank, until every spark of light blazing from the stars went dark, you drank, until your body could hold nothing more, and then you pissed right there in the yard, your bladder now emptied of its fire. That night, you learned the danger of a body burning and pleading and staggering towards you, so that years later, when I, a bright girl, ablaze and reckless, rushed to embrace you, you did only what you knew best to do. You stayed calm, moved quickly, took all the necessary precautions, snuffed out every ember. You saved yourself. The seed. The broccoli's gone to seed. The dipping hems remain unstitched. Uncut ends of my daughter's hair frayed and split. My father, reappearing after 40 years, cancer worming through his bowels, asking at last to see me, to seek forgiveness. And I see him, and he is sorry, and I forgive him, and he dies, and I go back to forgetting to return phone calls, to leaving the laundry unfolded in its basket. Um, the next two are from a brand new collection I'm working on called Year of the Dog um, that sort of deals with women and the Vietnam War. And um, this one is called, Hec it's a sonnet called Hecuba on the Shores of Da Nang, 1965, which was when the mm -hmm. Marines first landed. Uh, and much of the poems sort of deal with that sort of refrain from Adrian Rich about wanting more keening, more howling, so kind of what shape we have to take to go to that place of grief. Hecube on the Shores of Da Nang, 1965. Again the sea machines creep from the east, their Cronus jaws unlatched and pups expelled. The scene the same, again, again. The sand, now bootlace muck, the rutted shore resigned. No words will do. Laments will not withstand this thrashing tide. It's time for snarling beast speak. Nash, rattle, fracas, snap, unmuzzled hellhound chorus, unbound from roughened tongues. Kynal sima, keen, keen, lash, cack, Nine, grind, then ground, and rot, and reek, and teeth, 
and grief and gavel ratchet growl, custodian of woe. It doesn't end. Fleets on the reef, horizon buckling. To meet what comes, the body cleaves from all that is human. This poem is called Year of the Dog, and it's, um, it's, it's the, the person in it that speaks about Marianne Vecchio was the woman, the young woman, who was featured in the very famous Kent State photograph. She's the one screaming out. Um, Year of the Dog. In the photograph, Marianne Vecchio is kneeling in blood, arms outstretched until her body is nothing but stripped mast, mouth an obliterated star. Snowy blossoms shroud the dogwoods, and my mother is just starting to show. Everything's changed. Marianne won't make it to California, and Mom will bare her teeth, cage her whimpers before the Demerol kicks in. Marianne will turn 15 the same month I am born, wanting to leave Ohio behind her. She'll run away again. I'll enter this world purpled and yelping. It's the year of the dog. Nurses collared in starched whites, patrolling the floor. And then I'll end, speaking of beasts, I'm going to end with a poem. Uh, King Kong sort of occupied a number of my poems over the past few years. Uh, and this is one of them, King Kong in the Bronx. It's for my brother-in-law, Daniel. In the winter of 77, the jostling crowds at Lowe's Paradise Theater hollered out as the ape clung to the crumbling tower, desperate for escape, nearing collapse like a burned out tenement. The people rose from their seats, showering applause as Kong crushed propellers in his closing fists before his final plummet, their cheers rising higher than the smoke circling above the rows of neighboring buildings blackened and hollowed like rotting teeth. Daniel was too young to remember, but this morning in the car when he yells, I feel so good today, I feel like King Kong. He's saying the Bronx still dreams of Kong, rising from his demise, strolling along the grand concourse, offering his upturned palm. The Bronx dreams of its king, lifting the people from their slouched huddle at the bus stop, beyond the zoo and the ballpark, beyond the burrows of durate gravity, so when they turn back, they turn together like a planet, steady on its axis, like the tide, like the idea of a thing into the thing itself. They turn and turn and turn. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. That was amazing, amazing poems. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a 10 to 15 minute break uh, before William Monthly reads. So please uh, replenish your cocktails. The bartender works.